Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome for our uh, welcome to our webinar today. I'm Bruna Barbosa, Education Coordinator for PHN. So our webinar today uh, is uh, the title is Update on Schizophrenia, Schizoaffective Disorder, and Clozapine Treatment. Uh, I would like to start tonight's meeting by acknowledging the people of the Waijiru Nation and the different nations on which each of our participants meet tonight. I would like to acknowledge that the work of the traditional lands of many Aboriginal clans and nations and pay respect to the elders past, present and future and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water, culture and community. We are committed to working in the spirit of partnership and collaboration with our region's Aboriginal communities and peoples to improve their health, emotional and social well-being. I warmly welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands Australians who are presented tonight. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Amanda Treneman, Dr. Tov Hifjan and Richard Young for your uh, presence tonight. We are uh, very uh, glad to have you here. Uh, Dr. Amanda uh, was born and grew up in Broken Hill in the far west of New South Wales. She has been a psychiatrist for 30 years, working in public sector psychiatry in New South Wales. She has worked in acute patient mental health units, mental health rehabilitation units and community mental health settings in metropolitan Sydney, as well as regional New South Wales as a fly in psychiatrist. She also has worked for Western New South Wales LHD for the past 14 years and committed to improving high quality mental health services to patients in rural and remote New South Wales. Dr. Tove uh, was born and grew up in Sydney, completed the University in Newcastle. Uh, she commenced her medical career in the North Territory and completed GP training in 2006 and worked in various rural and remote locations since. Following her move to Orange in 2013, she had an increasing number of clients with major psychiatric illnesses and decided to retrain in psychiatry with a particular goal of specializing as a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Richard Young was born in Sydney and after many years in retail completed his uh, Bachelor of Nursing in 2010. He moved with his family to Orange for his new graduation new graduate year and remained working in general nursing. From 2012, he spent several years in various mental and health nursing positions through Sydney and Canberra, including close pine coordinator in the ACT. Since return to Orange in 2017, he has been responsible for the coordination of the clozapine and electroconvulsive therapy services as a clinical nurse specialist too for Western New South Wales Local Health District. So welcome everyone. And our learning outcomes for tonight will be understand the role of clozapine in the management of TRS, have confidence in prescribing and monitoring clozapine in their patients, and have a good understanding of supports and information available for clozapine prescribers. So welcome, Dr. Amanda. I will make you presenter and you can start. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Thanks, Bruno, for that introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, are you okay? Yeah. I've got Toby with me, by the way. Um, so our motivation for giving this talk tonight was a little bit selfish in that we were hoping to encourage and support GPs so that they can provide this life-changing and sometimes even life-saving treatment for our patients. I'll give a brief introduction on why we prescribe clozapine and then I'll hand over to Tova and then Richard so that they can talk in a bit more detail about the issues for GPs who are willing and keen to be involved. Oh, that was... oh yeah, sorry. Sorry, we're just having a slight problem. Ah, oh, here we go, sorry. So, Clozapine was first synthesized in 1956 
So it was one of the first antipsychotics identified. Chlorpromazine, the very first antipsychotic, had only come into use five years before in 1951. Clinical trials then took place in Europe during the 1960s and 70s, but after a granulocytosis was reported in Finland in 1975, um, it, uh, it really stopped being used for time. It did remain available in Europe and Asia where it was widely prescribed, um, in China particularly, but it was not used in the USA or Australia. However, in 1988, um, the Clotaril Collaborative Study Group study, headed by John Kane, most people have, in psychiatry have heard of this one, demonstrated the superiority of clozapine in the treatment of treatment resistant schizophrenia, a finding that's been replicated many times since. So following on from that in 1990, clozapine was approved again for clinical use in Australia and the US with a stringent monitoring system in place to detect neutropenia. Okay, so clozapine is an interesting molecule. It's structurally a diabenzodiazepine and is a derivative of the uh, well-known tricyclic antidepressant imipramine. It's metabolized in the liver to norclozapine, which is pharmacologically active, but has little clinical efficacy. It's metabolized extensively, extensively by the CYP isoenzyme system, and inhibition or induction of these enzymes may have clinically significant implications. It's got a steady state elimination half-life with a mean of 14.2 hours, which means that it can be given in a, as a single daily dose in most cases. It's a dirty drug in that it has activity at many receptor sites, including serotonin, dopamine, 5-HT, 2A, GABA, and MDA receptors, which may explain its wide range of clinical effects as well as its side effect profile. So of course we use it mainly the treatment resistant schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. Um, and approximately 30% of patients with schizophrenia have treatment resistance. That is, they have continuing significant or disabling symptoms despite trials of treatment with two or more antipsychotics at therapeutic doses. And in fact, most patients will have had trials of several or even many antipsychotics, psychotic medications before they start clozapine. We also use it in some cases of severe and hard to manage bipolar disorder, some cases of severe personality disorder, although this is controversial and not widespread in Australia. Um, it's also helpful in cases where patients are unable to tolerate the side effects of other antipsychotics and is the antipsychotic of choice in cases of tardive dyskinesia. It's generally underutilized and not overused in Australia. So when we start a patient on clozapine, the clinical response can be very dramatic and almost immediate. But in most cases, the improvement is more modest and gradual. And clinical response can occur over many months and we would normally recommend a 12 month trial before concluding that clozapine is ineffective. In the best case scenario, there can be complete or almost complete resolution of psychotic symptoms and a return to full function. But even failing this, um, symptomatic and functional improvement sufficient to allow discharge and reduce high risk behaviours can be seen. We're able in many cases to discharge from hospital very ill patients who might have faced long-term mm -hmm. institutional care due to the severity of their illness. And we see clinically significant um, uh, reductions in readmission rates, and that's replicated in larger trials. We do see improvement in the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, although unfortunately, usually not to the same extent as improvement in positive symptoms. Generally, tardive dyskinesia improves or can even resolve completely. And we see clinically and statistically significant reductions in depression, violence, suicide, substance and substance abuse. So 
because of these factors, patients started on clozapine usually stay on it for many years. Um, this is due to the combination of subjective and objective benefit, but also obviously lack of other options for effective treatment because of the reasons we've outlined for starting it in the first place. After the titration and stabilisation phase, there's a low risk of new emergent adverse reactions. And after the first 18 weeks of treatment, the risk of agranulocytosis reduces markedly. Now, unfortunately, clozapine does carry a relatively high burden of side effects, which can sometimes lead to ceasing and um, non-adherence with treatment. Um, Toad will go into these in a little bit more detail in a minute, but the common ones are sedation, which can be profound in the early phase of treatment, weight gain and metabolic syndrome, which is common, hypersalivation, constipation, which can be very severe and lead to bowel obstruction in rare cases. Many, if not most, clozapine patients need to be on long-term laxatives. Tachycardia is usually seen in the early titration phase, but come, sometimes can persist and requires treatment, usually with a beta blocker. And nocturnal urinary incontinence is not that uncommon. More uncommon or rare side effects include seizures, which are more common at the higher dose ranges and uh, serum levels, and can re require treatment with an anticonvulsant. Um, EPSC, tardive dyskinesia, akathisia, and neuroleptic malignant syndrome are all rare side effects but have been reported. Um, generally, with clozapine, we see a lower incidence of sexual dysfunction in, and infertility than in, on, than in the other antipsychotics, and patients of childbearing age on clozapine do become pregnant in the absence of reliable contraception. Um, agranulocytosis has been mentioned already, as has myocarditis, but we can also see reduced left ventricular function and cardiomyopathy. New onset obsessive compulsive disorder is a, an interesting, though rare, side effect that can sometimes require treatment with an SSRI. A couple of other issues before I finish. Um, clozapine can be very toxic in overdose or if it's rapidly reintroduced after a period of cessation. Um, and signs include severe sedation, delirium, seizures, and even death. Um, this is why gaps in treatment of longer than about 72 hours require retitration re of clozapine, usually in hospital. Um, Monitoring of clozapine with regular neutrophil counts has been highly successful at early detection and treatment of neutropenia. And as far as I'm aware, there have been no deaths um, due to this side effect um, reported in Australia since the start of the monitoring program. Monitoring of cardio, uh, cardiac function, um, which is routine, has successfully detected early cardiomyopathy. Again, the highest risk of myocarditis is in the first 28, 21 days of treatment, but um, if the patient presents with symptoms of chest pain, tachycardia, breathlessness, at any stage of treatment, they need to be investigated for this complication. Um, many thanks for your attention. I'm going to now hand over to Tobin, Tova, because it's the last of my slides. Can I go on to your next? And can we swap seats? Yeah, we can swap seats and we'll swap seats. Thanks a lot. Hello. Um, wow, it's very exciting to be talking to some colleagues. Um, my name is Toby Ripagan. I'm a GP. It says term psychiatry registrar, but I am still a GP and I am a psychiatry registrar. And my um, purpose in this talk, I guess, is to discuss the role of the GP in facilitating the treatment of patients with treatment resistant schizophrenia, schizophrenia with clozapine, which I've now experienced to be extremely effective um, and life changing. And, um, and I have been a prescriber of clozapine as a GP, and it's not 
it's not overly burdensome and with some basic strategies for managing the situation, I think um, it, it's, an easy toler it's an easy thing for any GP to do as part of their routine practice. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that I think GPs are crucial for patients to be able to access treatment with clozapine because um, as Dr. Treneman said, patients will be on their uh, treatment possibly for many, many years, if not lifelong. They need monthly assessments um, for the serious adverse side effects um, for that entire time. And, and there's not the resources at this point in time in mental health to be able to do that. So um, we really do rely on GPs to, to be able to provide this service to um, people with severe schizophrenia. Um, and I guess the other thing is that um, GPs are also very well placed for assisting in reducing the impact of clozapine on patients um, for, because of their you know, extremely high level of skill in identifying and treating um, lifestyle risk factors and introducing treatments for the metabolic syndromes that, that can be one of the severe side effects, one of the adverse effects. Um, as Dr. Treneman said, um, the GP role commences after the stabilisation phase of clozapine, so that's 18 weeks. Um, and so, so the, the early phase of treatment where um, the higher risk of adverse effects is, is not um, landed in the lap of the GP. It's really once we've kind of got that established, we know the dose, we know that it's all going to be running fairly smoothly, then um, getting the GP to engage in the shared care plan is, is how we can keep the treatment going. Um, I guess I just, back in my day, um, we had GP management plans and team care arrangements. I assume they still exist, as as does the GP mental health plan. And both of these um, these uh, Medicare rebates are, are useful ways of providing this service to to patients like who are on clozapine because they're such complex patients of um, often needing multidisciplinary involvement. So the monitoring process for um, the significant side effects of clozapine involved a monthly review, which um, is, is the GPs are ideally placed for, and then the six monthly review, which I'll refer to next. Um, the monthly review by the GP is um, to assess for any of the adverse effects that we might be concerned of, um, and specifically to assess the um, full blood count and then record that full blood count on what we call a cat form, which is sent with a script to the pharmacist um, to then enable the pharmacist to um, provide the clozapine for the next month. Um, the other uh, adverse effects to be looking at and, and assessing at, at each monthly review is the metabolic side effects and with weight gain, the cardiac side effects, and specifically myocarditis, so asking about chest pain and shortness of breath, um, and assessing for tachycardia and blood pressure. And then the other common side effects, such as the constipation, drooling, sedation, incontinence, and, and often, unless asked about, um, you know, many patients like, like these will not offer this sort of information to the GP. Now, in, in identifying an adverse effect, it doesn't mean that the burden of resolving that is completely on the GP and in fact um, I strongly recommend utilising the clozapine coordinator who is Richard Young in this case and he will be presenting later in this talk um, to fight to get assistance either um, on simple issues or on more complicated issues and in facilitating you back, making contact with um, a psychiatrist. Um, at any time, please, please make contact with a psychiatrist because it's not a burden um, of care that should do, uh, GPs need to take alone. So the six monthly review is to ensure is with a psychiatrist. Um, from the point of view of the GP, what's required is a, is a referral letter, um, which is useful because it kind of ensures the psychiatrist knows about any current medications, so anything that may have been introduced for some other medical reason, and also um, any concerns that you as the, as the treating GP might have about uh, current adverse effects that you've tried some strategies for that are um, improving, and um, to include the investigations that really help the psychiatrist in ensuring that the ongoing use of clozapine is safe and effective. So that's the clozapine level. So um, if you order a clozapine level, it comes back 
of the clozapine and the norclozapine level, which um, Dr. Chairman, Chairman talked about as being um, the um, metabolic next step for clozapine. And that assists the psychiatrist in knowing about um, adhe adhesion to therapy or um, unnecessarily high doses of clozapine. And so it's a useful part of the psychiatric assessment. Um, and also the psychiatrist knows about the current metabolic state and other um, you know, significant um, consequences of, of being on a treatment such as abnormalities in LFTs and UECs and can see the ECG. That helps uh, also make decisions about the safety of continuing with clozapine for the treatment of that individual. Um, so the psychiatrist then will assess um, and take a psychiatric, from a psychiatric point of view, as well as, as um, taking into account some of those um, uh, other uh, physical consequences of being on clozapine and, and think about ongoing treatment, what dose, more or less, and also assist in managing any of the side effects that are, are being struggled with at that point in time. So just talking about those side effects and what to do at, at, at the very simple level, um, and again, without any hesitation, seeking assistance from the clozapine coordinator. Um, if you get a white cell count back from the patient and their white cell count is greater than 3.5 um, in, or the neutrophil count is greater than 2, perfect, no problem. Um, continue on with the treatment. Don't worry if the white cell count is high unless you've got another reason to have a clinical concern for that. It's not related to the clozapine. Um, if you get a white cell count that is starting to trend towards the lower end, so um, less than 3.5 but over 3, or the neutrophil count is less than 2 but over 1.5, continue with the clozapine, but make contact with the clozapine coordinator and initiate twice weekly blood tests using a regulation 3 form. Um, with, with that result, going to the clozapine coordinator so that they can actually then access assistance from the psychiatrist and a haematologist who gives advice around um, clozapine management with neutropenia. If the um, white cell count is less than three or the neutral count is less than 1.5, don't continue with the clozapine, make contact with the clozapine coordinator. And of course, if you had any um, clinical concerns that the patient was actually profoundly neutropenic and unwell, you would send them straight to hospital. Um, with respect to the cardiac monitoring, the, the monthly, as I said, the monthly monitoring is around um, identifying um, the development of metabolic syndrome, identifying the development of um, myocarditis, um, so chest pain, shortness of breath, and also this um, emerge, the emergence of cardiomyopathy that can occur over time. Um, and one of the risk factors for that is thought to be the persistent tachycardia that can occur from clozapine idiosyncratically. Um, and and we, we treat that if, there's, if that's over 120 beats per minute persistently over a long period of time um, and there's no other reversible cause found, for example, thyroid or infection or, or some other cause. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the other thing is that um, if you were concerned about myocarditis, so you've got chest pain or shortness of breath, um, you know, ECD, troponin, CRP for the evidence of the inflammatory change, if the patient's unwell, send them to ED. Um, in, we also appreciate having a six monthly ECG to be able to have on the records of the, of the psychiatry treating team to take note of the, of the tachycardia that's persistent and also to be monitoring the QT interval. All antipsychotics can cause a prolongation of QT. Um, <clears throat> clozapine isn't one of the worst ones for that, but it is important to keep monitoring it. To monitor for cardiomyopathy, um, all patients who get commenced on clozapine have an, an echo done initially and then at 12 months and at 24 months and then five yearly after that. And sending those results through to the clozapine coordinator just ensures that the treating psychiatrist responds to any development of abnormality. <clears throat> so other side effects that um, Dr. Treneman talked about, um, the ones to sort of, I guess, be aware of as a GP that you can um, intervene with quite 
simply um, constipation, 100% of patients will get constipation because it's a hypomotility, um, of the hypomotility effects of clozapine. They may not all have profound constipation, but most of them probably should get some degree of treatment. Um, and the ileus that can occur from constipation from clozapine actually has got a higher fatality rate than neutropenia. So it's a serious side effect. Um, the hypersalivation or salivaria can be both in the daytime or the nighttime. Nighttime hypersalivation is probably um, not as a significant impediment to, to one's life. Um, we, treat, we tend to respond with some simple measures, but sleeping on a pillow with an extra um, absorbent towel. Um, but hypersalivation during the day can be really quite um, problematic in terms of someone's quality of life. There are treatment options available that um, can increase in intensity. So we use, um, we suggest something called quells, which is high scene. Um, it can be all over the counter. Um, glycopyranate, which is a muscarinic agent, can also um, be accessed by patients. It is important to be aware that these can have, these have got an anticholinergic side effect, so they can worsen constipation. Um, the other, the actual most effective way to treat is Botox injections, and I think we need to do a project in this area. In terms of enuresis, um, the causes are, you know, usually related to oversedation, and if patients are aware of that and um, and are given some advice around drinking fluid later in the day, <clears throat> that can be um, altered. Just one second. My glass of water. <laughs> But the other thing to be aware of is urinary retention. Um, this is a population that might be on um, clozapine for many years. So men, they might develop prostatism. So then they develop urinary retention and that's actually why they've got um, enuresis. Constipation is, a, is the most common cause of urinary retention as everybody knows. So um, it is important to assess for that if the patient is complaining of that. Um, in terms of responding to um, clozapine non-adherence, as Dr. Chenneman said, it's a high risk period um, if you reinitiate clozapine um, without considering um, the process carefully. It's important to try and get an accurate history of when, of how long the clozapine has not been taken for. And I think if you can't be confident about that, it has to be assumed that it's more than three days. Um, if it is less than two days, it's thought that there's no problem. If it's 100, if you're very confident and you just continue, if it's more than two days, um, contact the clozapine. And in any case, less than two days, contact the clozapine coordinator and continue. More than two days, contact the clozapine coordinator and there'd be a retitration that can be a bit more rapid than, than we are um, extremely careful of, but that would be under the guidance of the psychiatrist and the clozapine coordinator. If it's more than three days, then really um, people need to be in hospital for the retitration. probably. It's a bit too risky, um, particularly when you're living in a rural remote area like we are. Uh, and that's my last slide. So I really appreciate the opportunity to have a chat and um, we'll have some quick time for questions later and handing back to you guys, Katie, and then I think you're handing over to Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tov and Dr. Amanda. Thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. And now, Richard, you are able to start your presentation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I just turned off my uh, screen for, for a bit, but um, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to present on um, a lot of the resources for primary care. Uh, hi, everyone. So it means so much to uh, Dr. Chanerman, Dr. Rapagan, myself, um, that you've been able to join us this evening. Uh, my name is Richard, and I've seen a lot of people benefit from taking clozapine in the community. Uh, I've seen their journeys from admission to discharge, um, and from being severely unwell to being in remission and, and then thriving and living productive and meaningful lives in the community. Mm -hmm. um, I've been the clozapine coordinator in Western New South Wales now for five years. And before this, I spent a number of years as the 
clozapine coordinator in two community teams in the ACT, so Bell Conan and Gungarlan. In the time that I was there, there were no GPs prescribing clozapine, actually, and all of the clozapine management was conducted through the community mental health teams and the psychiatrists in those teams. Um, and both the, the ACT and Western New South Wales have a similar population of between 300 to 400,000 people. However, unlike the ACT, we, we have a very, very broad area. Um, so to put it in perspective, where the ACT is very concentrated within only 2.3 thousand square kilometres, uh, Western New South Wales LHD spans an area of over 400,000 square kilometres. So spread throughout our area, we have around 280 people who are prescribed clozapine. Uh, we also have on average around 10 to 14 extra people on clozapine every year. Um, it balances out, or it has balanced out over the last few years a little bit, but um, we, we do get quite a few extra people um, on clozapine. Um, and uh, this can be in small places, in, in rural areas um, that are far removed from centres like Orange or Bathurst. So we have people in towns like Ningen, Coonabarabran, Kindoblin and Walgett. So as you could imagine, it, it wouldn't be effective to have a model of care like they do in the ACT in, in our area. And even ever since um, 1992, when we first started the clozapine service in this district, uh, we've relied on the important services of primary care and local prescribers uh, in a GP shared care model, where the patient is at the centre and there is ongoing communication between GPs, pharmacists, psychiatrists and the centre coordinator. So we really see the GP as an essential part of the treating team as our mental health services would be overwhelmed trying to keep up with that demand for monitoring, prescribing. So many of our clients um, otherwise might fall through the cracks um, and across our district there is a looming shortage of medical officers uh, across the board, not just GPs, but um, uh, I have heard a statistic saying that up to 73% um, are saying that they're likely to leave our area, the Western New South Wales um, LHD within the next 10 years, which is a bit of a dire statistic. Uh, so in other words, we really need you and like we need more GPs to take up that ongoing task of prescribing clozapine so that we're able to continue keeping people with treatment resistant schizophrenia stable and close to home. So having said this, I'm always aware that we don't want to overburden existing prescribers with more and more patients. But over the last few years, I've concentrated on strengthening two aspects of the clozapine service model that we use in Western New South Wales. So these are our use of virtual services and our GP shared care model. So our district has now been set up in a way that allows for a smoother transition between hospital, community and primary care services. So for example, in Dubbo, we have a service that's run out of the Dubbo community mental health team with a very dedicated and long serving nurse who helps to run the weekly clozapine clinic with two psychiatry registrars under the Dubbo Clinical Director of Mental Health. Uh, some of the clients who access this service are seen from places such as Wellington or Walgett via video conference. And over the last four years, we've had, um, we've dramatically improved the service by registering over 15 active GPs who now see just over half the clients in the Dubbo Hub. So within the same time frame, the number of people taking clozapine has doubled. So we're now working on making sure that these people are seen regularly through this service for their six monthly psychiatry reviews. Uh, so in the Orange and Bathurst hubs, we have had already a, an established GP shared care model. Uh, we have over 60 registered GPs, including some in small towns such as Trundle or Blaney and Molong. Uh, most of our people are seen on a six monthly basis by the psychiatrist or registrar in the local community mental health team. 
However, if a person is outside of Orange or Bathurst and they're no longer case managed through a mental health team, we have a virtual service uh, through the mental health emergency care or the MEC team every Tuesday between 1 and 3 p.m. Uh, this is run by Tova and myself and uh, we will often see patients uh, on initiation therapy. So after discharge from hospital up until the end of their 18 weeks before we transition the patient for further community mental health team follow-up and primary care. So if a person is doing well and are independent with blood tests and appointments, they may be discharged from the mental health service. But in terms of follow-up and care planning, clinical nurse consultants in Dubbo, Orange and Bathurst and myself have now taken on these clients for ongoing support. So I think the resounding message that I would like everyone to sort of get out of this webinar is to know that you're not working alone. So most people on clozapine, they do really well in the community. Some are very independent, while some require a little support, and there is always that support available. And aside from clinicians in the mental health team, I'm available for consultation with anything clozapine related. For example, if you need to be registered to prescribe clozapine, I have direct access to the Clopine Central website and can complete the registration request over the phone. And in most cases, registration is approved in only a few hours and you're able to access the site and see your patient's clozapine details there. So I provide helpful resources and advice for first time prescribers via email. Uh, and I've been using the new GP patient transfer summary in the GP shared care guide. Uh, this summary includes important clozapine related information on top of the standard discharge summary that you may get from the hospital. Um, often GPs will contact me directly about concerns that they have with their patients. Uh, for example, if a patient had a break in therapy and can be restarted in the community, I can provide advice on what dose to retitrate from, how frequently blood should be taken, etc. Um, also, if a patient's results are in the red range, uh, I will advise that the clopine haematologist be contacted and will liaise with the psychiatrist and any community mental health clinician that's looking after the patient to make sure that they stop taking clozapine, at least until there is a discussion between the treating team and the haematologist um, and a decision is made to continue. So in fact, this happened just recently. Uh, the haematologist determined that the neutropenia was not a result of an adverse reaction to the clozapine and advised continuing with the treatment. So this means that there wasn't a break in therapy. Uh, we we're able to increase the frequency of the monitoring for a short while, as the blood said, the next day returned to normal. Um, patients are also not locked into having monthly blood tests or only receiving 28 days of tablets. So there are exceptions where perhaps a client is going away and needs to have extra medications. So I can be helpful in assisting you to work out how to manage the blood tests around that and, the, and providing extra medications. Um, a patient can get up to 180 days of clozapine as long as regular blood tests are maintained or they can get an extension on the blood test for up to two weeks. Um, another avenue of support is of course Clopine Central. Sorry. And they're, they are available 24 seven um, to provide advice, resources, um, or to help point you in the right direction. For example, who you might need to contact in the district. So Clopin Hub is a website where you'll find all sorts of information that could be useful. Uh, I think that you should feel free to register to this site even if you're just thinking about becoming a registered clozapine prescriber. Um, and, and if you're not sure, um, it has information on monitoring and the GP shared care program and other great resources. Uh, for example, there are quick reference guides for hematological monitoring and there's one for cardiac monitoring and a link to an app that your patients could use to help track, um, keep track of appointments and uh, appointment times and various contacts, et cetera. Uh, it also has a bunch of resources on that app, which is useful for, uh, for patients as well. 
And as recently as April this year, Clopine Central has produced this GP shared care program guide to help GPs better understand the requirements of clozapine prescribing. Um, so here I'll show you a few highlights from this guide. There is a checklist uh, of monitoring requirements and their timeframes. Uh, so when full blood counts are due, um, when it's a good idea to take clozapine levels and get ECGs, etc. There's also useful questions to ask your patient. And I think that even this could be used uh, as a checklist that people can fill out in the waiting room. Um, it just has some very useful uh, questions to know for each, each review. And of course, the GP transfer summary, which I mentioned earlier, which includes patient history and dates of relevant tests such as the echocardiogram or blood, glu uh, blood glucose monitoring. Um, so if you're prescribing clozapine and you don't have this guide, reach out to me and I can send you both a hard copy and an electronic version, or you can access this guide from the clopine hub. And lastly, the, the New South Wales Clozapine Coordinators Network um, I'm a member of the steering committee for this, um, is a group of coordinators who work towards ensuring that best practice for clozapine treatment is upheld across the state. Uh, the CCN, um, I'd like to give you a, a sneak peek at what the CCN is planning for next year. Uh, we'll be registering a clozapine network through the mental health professionals network uh, for health clinicians across the state who have an interest or are involved in treating people with treatment resistant schizophrenia or who are working with people taking clozapine. Uh, we'll be up, uh, holding regular webinars with CPD points um, and guest speakers and spreading useful and up-to-date information through the network for anyone who's registered. So please watch this space, should be happening earlier um, next year. So I really hope that you can come away from this webinar knowing that clozapine is really an essential medication for so many people experiencing treatment resistant schizophrenia and that you know that support is there to make the process of prescribing clozapine easier and that you feel confident to assist our services in prescribing clozapine for your patients due to this available support. So thank you so much. And it might be time for questions. Thank you. Thank you all for the excellent presentation and for sharing your experience with us. Uh, I'm sure it was very helpful for our GPs, our pharmacists, and other prof professionals present tonight. Uh, now I welcome Dr. Tov to facilitate our Q&A session. Uh, so thank you for facilitating for us. Uh, you can uh, pop your questions into the question box and our presenters will answer you. Thank you. Okay, so um, thanks everyone who's put their questions in. Jane Lawrence, we've covered the cessation question. What level of tachycardia without side effects warrants treatment? And um, my understanding, I mean, it's a bit nuanced, but if it's persistently above 120, the suggestion, or if there was um, emerging signs on an echo, obviously, but yeah, persistently above 120. Um, and the treatment is a tenolol, is, is what's been recommended um, that I've found. Um, and um, Dr. Singh, I think somebody will send you the email details. To Dr. Singh would like to know how to register Richard. Yay, yeah, good. So, and there is no course. You've done the course, Dr. Singh. <laughs> you this came to this. <laughs> but if you've got any questions or feel worried, please make contact. Can you discuss the, your experiences of managing patients interested in quitting smoking? Well, that's a big question. That's another webinar, isn't it? Um, interestingly, when patients are on closet, well, of course, um, patients with serious mental illnesses have very, very, very high rates of smoking, much higher than the general population. We know that. 
and they not only have high rates of smoking, they have high levels of nicotine addiction and they smoke more because they smoke more heavily than other people. Um, what we do know about clozapine is that um, for some reason, and it's not clear why, uh, patients on clozapine frequently uh, find it uh, easier to give up smoking and are more motivated to give up smoking. So it does happen that people on clozapine might bring it up spontaneously or are more open to discussing the smoking question once they've stabilised on clozapine. Um, I think one should treat the patient on clozapine who wants to quit smoking as one would any other patient who wants to quit smoking. That is with a great deal of support and encouragement and access to all of the quit smoking um, resources, including lots a generous sort of amount of NRT that is available. Um, we have all our patients, all our patients in hospital are offered NRT of course, um, even though they don't necessarily quit smoking. Um, one thing I would hesitate to use is Zyban um, because uh, even though that's highly effective, it can lead to um, deterioration in mental state in patients with serious mental illness. So I do tend to shy away from that, although some psychiatrists do use it successfully in people with serious mental illness. Um, but generally speaking, if a patient can be encouraged to keep, quit smoking and is willing to give it a go, then I'm very, very happy to hear about it. Uh, and you should try it. On the other hand, you should also know that if they do successfully quit smoking, their clozapine levels may shoot up because nicotine um, and smoking induces that CYP isoenzyme system. So the, the patient may need to be on a lower dose of clozapine after they've successfully quit smoking. Hmm. Yeah, so that's something that in the six monthly review, it's good for the psychiatrist to know that there's a change in smoking. And something I learned was that the inhaled cigarettes don't affect the um, amount of clozapine in the blood. So, so if someone transitions to an e-cigarette, it's it it um, can also mean that the effectiveness of a clozapine is increased, and their dose might need to be decreased. So, um, so it's obviously not nicotine. No, it's to do no, with the cigarettes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cigarettes, yeah. Anyway. Um, so the next question is about the echoes and look I have I have had to have a learning experience for this I've always I'm a bit paranoid and you know like to keep an eye on people's hearts I guess they've got mental illness and their cardiac risk factors are so high and no you don't actually have to do them every every year um, it is that regime of initial 12 months 24 months and then five yearly of course you know, if there's a change, that might change because you find an abnormality at 24 months, and so then they need to have more frequent monitoring. So, but the the, the guidelines are assuming that there's no adverse um, findings on the echo, initial 12 months, 24 months, and then five years. Um, and that's all the questions we've got at the moment, but. We are very happy to keep answering questions until people don't want to ask them. Um, one of the things I, I did want to say like that I've um, in doing my my clinics with Richard, it, um, I've noticed the people who because I've come from working in the acute unit and seeing people really really unwell and getting on clozapine and um, and then you know that's one of the more dramatic things but I've also met all these people who are out in in the community um, living quality of lives that you don't expect they're going to get to one when you see them in the acute unit um, having been stabilized on clozapine and it's been incredibly rewarding to be part of that longer term psychiatric follow-up. Mm -hmm. Can you get mm -hmm. Medicare rebate for the 12-month echo? Hmm. You are you saying that can you order it through um, can the can the ultrasonographer can the echo provider do that? I don't know, Sandra. 
That's a question I don't know. Thank you, Sandra. I didn't realise that. That's a very interesting problem. And GPs can't order echoes more than every 24 months. Hmm. Interesting. Richard, this is a problem we need to right. find a solution. That is very interesting. Yes, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll investigate that more. Although Jane is wondering if it's about the stress echo, not the echo echo. But a psychiatrist might have the option. I think we will sort that out. That's cool. Thank you very much. Hmm. Yep. Cool. And Dr. Harwood refers their patients to the visiting cardiologist for related echoes. I don't know if everyone else can see these questions, so I'm reading them out. Yeah, I don't think they can. <laughs> um, no. Has anyone had any really bad experiences um, that, I don't know, you can't talk, I guess, but anything particularly bad or typical? Okay, uh, do you have more questions? If you have more questions, we have more a few minutes. Jane, I think clozapine is a wonderful drug too. It can be um, nasty, but it's also fantastic, life-changing. I would like to say, uh, yes, uh, Jane has made a comment that she thinks clozapine is a wonderful drug. I mean, I've been using it for 30 years and I think it's terrific too, but um, I think often some of the benefits are not really, um, really well spoken about because what we're all looking for is this sort of big improvement in psychotic symptoms and negative symptoms. And yes, you do get those, but even if the person still has psychotic symptoms, which they very frequently do, um, their quality of life may be better in other ways. And, and those reductions in substance abuse and smoking that we've talked about, um, uh, depression, aggression, and, and very, very importantly, a big reduction in suicide rates are really, really critical mm. parts of the clozapine experience. Um, and, and really, just those alone make clozapine a wonderful drug. And, yeah, just quickly in response to um, the question here from um, Dr. Harwood, Metabolic syndrome remains the major ongoing challenge. And I think that's true. And I think um, one of my thoughts, one of my comments was gonna be the importance of that um, six monthly review with the treating psychiatrist to make sure that the dose is still required at that dose. And we've, um, okay. I've, you know, we've found a number of people who have just weaned down the dose titrate and a lot of them get anxious about doing that. But over a period of time, people, people might not need the same level of treatment as they had done and, and it is important to keep on reconsidering that significant adverse effect. Things the GP can do is maybe add metformin even in a non-diabetic patient because that has been shown to have an impact, a positive impact um, on the weight gain and metabolic syndrome issue. Um, and in discussion with Sometimes putting the patient on a small dose of aripiprazole mm -hmm. can be quite helpful with that as well. So I've, I've done that um, and it's been somewhat successful in some cases in, you know, being able to reduce the clozapine dose a bit, but also aripiprazole is an atypical antipsychotic that's more sort of activating and sometimes people do manage to lose a bit of weight and they certainly get are less sedated. So that's that's a that's a, quite a useful augmentation strategy, but the first line is to put them on metformin and that can sometimes curtail the weight gain. And then the question from Dr. Singh, is clozapine safe for patients with a history of hematological malignancy um, or pericarditis or and pericarditis because you could have pericarditis from hematological malignancy? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, that'd be a, a, a tricky one. Um, it's probably not an absolute contraindication, but would need 
um, specialist review by and advice from a haematologist for the um, haematological issue and we would get a cardiology consult um, in relation to the pericarditis history issue. Um, you know, we've recently started a few patients back on clozapine who've had cardiac histories unrelated to clozapine and it's been quite successful. Mm. So you can do it, but you need to be careful and you need to get good advice. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Amanda, Dr. Tove and Richard. It was very useful, a good Q&A session. Thank you so much. And uh, we strongly appreciate if you take a time to share your opinion about this webinar. And the education team look forward to seeing you all very soon. Have a good evening. So you just ask you to give your feedback for us about this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Have a lovely evening.